Hello, and welcome to Media Evil, a medieval pop culture podcast, where we talk about how medieval and medieval-inspired movies, TV, and books depict the medieval world. What did they get right? What did they get wrong? And what do they tell us about how modern people see the medieval past? I'm Sarah Iftdecker, a medieval historian, and today I'll be talking about the first season of the TV show Vikings with guest Ali Pitts. Hi, Ali. Welcome. Hello. Thank you very much for having me on, Sarah. It's a, it's a delight. I'm a big fan of the podcast. Thank you very much, and really happy to have you. So do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so in the context of this podcast, uh, I did a, um, a degree in history uh, many years ago now, and it was mostly in terms of the stuff that I picked out was medieval and early modern. Um, mm-hmm. So it's very much an interest uh, uh, for me going back quite a long time. So when I found out that this podcast existed, I was kind of like, oh, that sounds <laughs> like right up my street. So I was I was super excited to, to to listen to it. I'm a big fan and was really delighted to have the opportunity to, to be on here. Yeah, well, it's great having you on. And uh, so this is actually something that you suggested in particular that you were interested in watching and talking about for the podcast. Yeah. So yeah, why were you especially excited about the Vikings? Uh, well, so during during my university degree, I got to spend a term slash semester in my second year um, over at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark studying. Mm. I think the module was called Scandinavian Society from 800 to 1200. So mm-hmm. obviously very, very Viking focused. And we got to do cool stuff like we took a trip across Denmark visiting various sites um, including Roskilde which was the seat of the Danish kings in the Mm -hmm. Viking age and I'm not sure at what point they moved over to Copenhagen but for for a long time Um, and that included visiting the uh, Viking ship museum so um, so that was that was cool getting to see all these like remains of wrecks and they actually uh, gave us the chance to go on a quick viking voyage around the around the fjord oh, wow. <laughs> on on a replica longship so yeah we were we were probably That's pretty out. cool yeah yeah that was definitely what like one of my best experiences at, at university so that was amazing to have been able to do that wow I've never been to any of these Scandinavian countries, and my main Viking tourist-related experience has been Jorvik, the kind of Viking museum and experience. It is an mm. immersive experience in York, which yeah. I will say is a little cheesy but entertaining. That was the impression I've got. I've been to York about three or four times now. I've never actually made it into the, the museum, but I always kind of got the impression that it would be kind of cheesy, so I... I I sort of avoided it for that reason, but maybe I should be less judgy. <laughs> it has authentic smells, which is a choice. <laughs> yeah, that is that is certainly a choice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, good good for yeah. them, I, I guess. <laughs> I at least have just watched season one of Vikings since I had not watched it previously and did not have time to watch the full, what are there, five seasons? I think so. I think they've announced okay. a season six or something. Yeah, I'd seen the first two seasons i randomly saw the dvds in the chariot in a charity shop a couple of years back maybe three years back and just watched the first couple of seasons but didn't i I enjoyed it but didn't particularly feel the need to carry on with it it's now available in the states at least it's available via i think both amazon and hulu for Mm. anyone who wants to watch it after this it originally aired and as far as i know i think is still on the history channel Yes, which is uh, very typical of what the History Channel has become. The History mm. Channel used to have actual documentaries and you know history, and now it has some combination of uh, historical fiction like this and things that are called documentaries, but that are mostly about how Hitler was an alien or something along those lines. Yeah, I was going to say I'd heard that there's a lot of like alien conspiracy theory, like. Well, some people think that this might be true. So at this point, I think the most historically accurate thing on the History Channel might be, I think like Pawn Stars or something is on the History Channel. And that at least has some occasional moderate and Mm. as far as I can tell, fairly accurate historical content. Mm. Mm. I mean, we'll we'll (laughs) get, yeah, yeah, I mean, we'll get into it uh, just through the course of the uh, the episode. But my impression that I got just doing 
some reading for for this show and and just kind of like recalling what I learned at university. It seems like Vikings is a pretty well researched uh, show. You know, they didn't just go, "Oh, Vikings, that's the horned helmet guys." <laughs> Right, absolutely. So but, that was definitely, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that more in more detail later. But I yes. definitely did get absolutely the impression that this is a show where somebody actually sat down and did research, which is very nice because often I do not get that sense watching medieval <laughs> movies oh. and TV shows. Viking stars, I will say a number of people that I do not know from mm. anything. Yeah. So uh, Travis Fimmel plays uh, Ragnar Lothbrok, who is, uh, he is a very Aryan looking gentleman. <laughs> I've never seen him in anything. Apparently, he's a model. Mm, yes, I think that was his job before. Yeah, yeah, his success in this. He smirks a lot, but on the whole, I would say he's a perfectly fine actor. Mm. Catherine Winnick as his wife and the shield maiden Lagertha, who I recognized actually from several episodes of Bones. Mm. She's a kind of love interest of a character for a bit. Yeah, I found a random detail about her was, I don't know whether she was born in Ukraine or whether it was just her parents mm. were Ukrainian, but I saw some detail, I think it was on the IMDb trivia, that she spoke only Ukrainian until she was about oh, like, wow. seven or eight. So I thought that was that was pretty interesting. It is. And she, she had an interesting accent, actually, that I was mm. trying to place and then forgot to actually look up. So mm. I guess that's what it is. Yeah, I think I think she grew up or, yeah, most of her life has been spent in Canada. So Okay. It also stars Clive Standen as Ragnar's brother Rollo, who, mm. again, I have not seen in anything. But he is in, I believe, two other medieval set TV programs. So maybe he will be making a future appearance. Hmm. George Blagden as Athelstan, the captive Anglo-Saxon monk who played Grantaire in Les Miserables. So apparently he should have been doing a lot more singing in this show than he was. Yeah, I mean, there was, he was a monk. They should have spent more time, you know, doing the Gregorian chants. Yes. The one person that I genuinely had heard of, had not known was in the show, and then was very excited to see that he was in the show is Gabriel Byrne playing mm. Earl Haraldson who is in a number of things. Uh, I think he's quite a good actor. Uh, he's in The Usual Suspects. Uh, he's in Man in the Iron Mask, which will be covered at some point. Yeah, um, I hadn't seen him in a ton of things, but I recently watched the 1993-1994 uh, Little Women, and he plays mm. like a German professor in that. Right. And I, ha I have to say, it, it's, it, it's funny, he's, he's not... He doesn't seem to have aged all that much in the, well, I guess nearly 20 years between that and and this. I mean, I think he I think he's probably about 60 now. But um, yeah, he was kind of like a quite old looking like late 30s slash early 40s in, in, in Little Women. So, yeah, it was nice seeing him in a very different role. Right. And he's he's still I would say he's very distinguished looking. He's aged pretty well, I would say, mm -hmm. on the whole. He would say was clearly, in a lot of ways, the most talented actor in this, which makes his mm. demise, as we'll get to shortly, a little sad. Yeah. And uh, then his uh, wife, Siggy, is played by Jessalyn Gilsig, who I have never seen, but I actually just wanted to note that Wikipedia mostly talks about the fact that apparently she's Jewish. Mm. There's like five separate indicate like references in the Wikipedia article on her to the fact that she is Jewish which I really just find a little funny in that Vikings are stereotypically presented as being just extremely Aryan. Mm. And so kind of amusing that you have a uh, Jewish actress playing one of the major characters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in our first main section, the enumeratio or recap, we'll go through a little of the details about uh, the TV show. I'm going to start with just talking, giving a kind of very brief recap, a sort of summary to orient us, and then we can move on to talking about uh, more of the details. The story begins in 793 AD. Despite failing to receive permission from his earl, the Viking warrior Ragnar Lothbrok has a ship built and gathers a band of warriors to raid with him in the fabled land of England. He has several staunch supporters, including his wife, the shield maiden Lagerta, an eccentric shipbuilder named Floki, and his brother Rollo, who is consistently actually pretty terrible, but also increasingly less supportive. He takes captive the Christian monk Athelstan, who also becomes an ally of his. Earl Haraldson sees Ragnar as a threat and eventually declares him to be a criminal and attacks him. Ragnar ultimately defeats him in single combat and becomes Earl. His wife tells him that she is pregnant with a third child after a long period without bearing children, but she has a miscarriage. 
Ragnar prays to the god Odin to ask who will bear the many sons that were promised to him, and then promptly cheats on his wife with a woman named Eslog while on a diplomatic mission to another earl as the emissary of the king. And that is where the first season comes to an end. My wife had a theory about the structure of the series because it very much, Mm -hmm. it kind of culminates in the middle and then the the remaining few episodes, it's a bit more meandery and you have a random episode towards the end where they go off to a pagan festival and it's just kind Mm -hmm. of like they just hang out there. But her theory was that they were like deathly afraid of getting cancelled so that they they kind of like front loaded the main plot into the first you know half of the of the season which is why it culminates with uh mm-hmm. you know you have this the standoff with earl haraldson and ragnar coming pretty much in the middle rather than towards the end they were kind of like not wanting to drag it drag it out and risk being cut off which i, I thought was an interesting theory that makes a lot a lot of sense to me as a theory because that definitely felt like a series finale kind of moment mm. and but then it kept going yeah so I don't know how you felt. I was not a fan of the opening credits, which definitely made me a little nervous going in. And I will say it ended up then being, for the most part, better than I expected. But the opening credits, something about the song itself and then the whole aesthetic kind of made it seem like it might be a music video for a band who, if you do a little digging, are going to turn out to actually be (laughs) neo-Nazis. Yeah, unfortunately, there are bands like that out there, yeah. I guess it, it's leaning kind of hard into the stereotypes of this is the Vikings. They're about violence and chips and sexy time. and <laughs> Right. And I think there's definitely some amount of an emphasis on that, especially in the first few episodes, but honestly, really mm. in a lot of ways throughout the whole season. Yeah. As to some extent, a we're going to give people what they want in terms of what they expect from the Vikings. Mm, yeah. It begins with this very vicious fight on the battlefield. People are covered in blood semi-constantly throughout the course of this season. Oh yeah, and no, no one washes washes their face. They're just happy to no. just walk around like smeared with other people's insides. Yeah, it's just all the time. The other thing that really struck me with the opening scene, just a quick note, is that very quickly Norse mythology is presented as arguably real. Mm. That there's this emphasis on people seeing ravens who are known as a companion of Odin. And I think Ragnar actually even sees a kind of shadowy figure supposed to be Odin himself gathering up the souls of those who have died in battle. Yeah, that that first battle did not go particularly well for either side. I think it's right. kind of it's pretty much a Pyrrhic victory because it's <laughs> it's Ragnar and Rolo are the kind of the last two men standing. I mean, maybe there's right. some some other people off to the side. It it seems like they wanted to get that that particular scene done with as little budget as possible. Yes. Because they they kill like about two guys. And I will say one of the things that's really interesting is that throughout the film the battles mostly do not involve a lot of people which i think in some ways actually makes sense to me that probably a lot of these raids didn't necessarily involve massive armies fighting one another Mm. and so i think it is accurate but it's also very different from how things are often portrayed and uh, it is also a choice that is probably good for their budget overall and that they don't need to worry about either hiring huge volumes of extras or about basically making cgi armies Mm, yeah that that is a, a good aspect i i thought and from what i recollect about this time period is that when this is happening it is a bit early for the bigger armies to be showing up yeah. i think like 50 60 years around the time of alfred things were getting a lot more organized and a whole bunch of different towns and within scandinavia kind of like grouping together to send big parties over. And the English kings also are not amassing massive armies, especially because they often don't quite know or expect exactly when they're coming. So I think it does make a lot of sense. Yeah. And this is, again, something that doesn't necessarily come over in medieval themed set or set TV series, but standing armies weren't really a thing. You had... Right. There's also a lot of sex and a very heavy emphasis on the fact that sex takes place in a lot of kind of public or semi-public settings and Mm -hmm. that it is something that you know children in the family are very used to seeing their parents having sex 
this is also something that I have a sense is probably mostly true and that there's not a lot of privacy in the Middle Ages. No, I think you have to live in a big castle to be somewhere where you can be a long way away from everyone else. And so especially for the people where, you know, they don't have enough money that every member of the family has their own separate bedroom, it's more or less just in the family, essentially one room where everybody's sleeping. And yeah. so I do appreciate that there's this kind of emphasis on that as being something that is happening and that that's actually probably pretty realistic. Yeah, definitely. The medieval housing is is much more, this is where you spend the night so you don't die of cold and exposure rather than the place you spend most of your day. Right. There is also a lot of rape in this Mm. show like a lot yeah perhaps not (laughs) and i haven't seen game of thrones all the way through i've read all of the books but i think it's less so than from what i've heard about game of thrones but yeah you uh, would agree there's a lot i think there might be more in the first season of this than there is in the first season of Mm. game of thrones but i could be wrong because it's been a while since i watched the first season Mm. of game of thrones and i also will say i think i am much more sensitive now than i was when i first started watching game of thrones Mm. to the question of how rape is being used as a plot device yeah and it's something that bothers me a lot more and strikes me a lot more than it did at the time yeah i mean Obviously, having it as a plot device is is bad as it's super bad, but also just having it incidental rape when it's kind of like, oh, and we're just having this happen. There's no point to it happening. We we just need to kill like three minutes of time. And yeah, this right. Can, this is this is something that people do at this point. So yeah, we'll just stick that in there. Yeah. And I have a lot of thoughts about the way in which rape is presented as a kind of normal everyday thing in the Middle Ages as being essentially a way to kind of make claims about rape as being something that is fundamentally pre-modern and a medieval problem, and Mm. that things therefore are now better, which honestly they're kind of not. And obviously it was a problem in the Middle Ages, but I don't necessarily think there's any reason to think that it's actually that much worse than that it is now, where it clearly is a very serious problem still. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. Yeah, so I definitely have... A lot of feelings about that kind of choice. But yeah, so within the first four episodes, uh, we see Lagertha fight off two attempted rapists. Uh, I will say her line when they basically say, you know, we'll kill you if you resist. And then she responds, you couldn't kill me if you tried for a hundred years is a pretty great line. Yeah. She then gets sexually harassed by her brother-in-law, Rolo. And at this point, I'm just watching him and I'm like... Are we supposed to like him? And how long are we going to be supposed to like him? Mm, Yeah, Rolo was... Well, he was mostly a dreadful character, but at one point you see he decides to have mercy on a sick Anglo-Saxon whose house he's in the process of of burgling. It's kind of like, up until now, Rolo's been kind of unambiguously a horrible person, and then he has this one moment of like, hmm, I'm not actually going to hit this guy with my axe, I'm going to give him a drink, and then I'm going to steal the cup when he's like half finished. So, hey, I'm not so awful after all. That seemed like a really weird choice to me. Yeah, no, Rolo, you're still a rapist, so I'm still, yeah. you know, still not going to be a fan. Yeah, since we also have seen him successfully rape a woman in addition to being basically on the verge of raping his sister-in-law. Yeah. And so there's also a lot of back and forth over the course of this season about the question of whether he's going to stick with or betray his brother. Mm. And to some extent, I'm like, can we just kind of hurry up to the point where he betrays his brother already so that we can stop having them pretend to like him yeah hashtag let him die hashtag let him die <laughs> yeah that is my attitude about rollo the entire time by oh. the end it's kind of my attitude about ragnar too but if mm, rollo is getting yeah. is rollo gets the first hashtag let him die yeah yeah um ragnar has a has more of a of an arc and his character yes. moves in a direction and it's not necessarily a, a positive one the thing i thought was hilarious about Rolo throughout the series is just the fact that he seems to essentially wear a sign around his his neck saying I'm really jealous of my brother please prod me about that and try and tempt me on the basis of how much (laughs) I can't stand the fact that he's more popular than me because Earl Haraldson does it the whole time that he's part of the series and then at the end as soon as Jarl Borg who's a a big part of series two he he just meets Rolo and is like, you don't like your brother, do you? 
let's talk yeah. about that. And it's just like, no, no, I don't. Uh, so I thought that was funny how that how transparent that is and how everyone yeah. knows to kind of just like prod that wound a bit. Yeah, he's deeply unsubtle. He also spends a lot of time whining about how they're supposed to be equal, despite the fact that very clearly they're not equal in terms of that Ragnar is taking on a position of leadership that Rollo does not have. And then Rollo is very grumpy about this and keeps questioning his brother's decisions. And yeah, whining. he's like, he's essentially like, everyone should follow me because I have really big biceps. Right. <laughs> he's like, he's uh, really, should we though? Yeah, he's really the kind of Anakin Skywalker of the of the of Vikings in terms of his whininess. Yes. I will say Ragnar doesn't always entirely help because a lot of the time Rolo will challenge his decisions and ask questions. And there are definitely cases where I felt like, okay, Rolo's being kind of a whiny asshole. <laughs> but also Ragnar could answer the question and explain his choices as opposed to making cryptic snarky comments. Ragnar is is a little bit pleased with himself at, at times. And actually the, yeah. most and most of the time he Ragnar gets away with that, but there is one one point where he scores a massive own goal. This is when Earl Haraldson is in the process of confiscating the proceeds of of their raid, which comes across as massively out of order. He didn't do any of the work and mm-hmm. and yet um, he's getting all all the the spoils from it essentially apart from like one item each and Ragnar stupidly says it was as easy as taking something from a baby and Earl Haraldson says well in that case uh, as it was so easy you don't mind if I take all the stuff and Ragnar's like <laughs> right Doh. and Ragnar also seems to in general I will say that's his kind of one moment where he, despite having disobeyed the orders of the Earl, who pretty much explicitly told him, no, you can't go west, you go where I tell you in terms of raiding. Mm. And he obviously goes west and goes off to England and raids and takes all of this nice stuff from churches. Mm. And after that, he at least is, I would say, slightly conciliatory in that whole situation. And so he does put uh, the Earl in a position where the Earl feels more justified, perhaps, in demanding that he basically takes all of the cool stuff. Mm. But at the very least, I was impressed to some extent at that moment with Ragnar's political instinct in terms of his making the decision at that point to try to keep the Earl from getting too mad about the fact that he had disobeyed orders. Yeah. And then just increasingly becomes more smug and less willing to kind of try and conciliate the Earl. Yeah, but the Earl also pretty much just decides, okay, I hate this guy, he's a threat, I'm just going to wipe him out. Yeah, there's some amount of that escalating very quickly. Uh, But first, I actually do want to uh, make a couple of comments about the raids in England itself. Mm. So first of all, I think it is interesting. There's a really big emphasis on technology and the technological advances that make it possible for them to go to England, that there's a new method of navigation. Ragnar gets from somebody I actually do not remember from who and nor did I write it down, but that he gets a sun, what's it called? A sun sun tablet. Yeah, Yeah, a sunboard sunboard. and a sunstone. Yeah, I actually listened to the commentary from the first episode and apparently there was a theory when they wrote the thing that this sunstone was a thing, but they didn't have any confirmation. But like during the time since they wrote it and the episode came out a stone that looks very much like what a sun- sunstone theoretically would be has been found so i mean obviously yeah. it's a it's a dvd commentary point <laughs> rather than rather than something uh, that i've managed to find in a journal or something but i thought that was interesting that they'd mentioned that anyway yeah definitely and i will say and you'll touch on this a little bit more later this is very much an area where because a lot of the research on that is happening on the vikings right now has to do with archaeological evidence Mm. and with archaeological findings because of that this is an area where there is actually more and more we are learning that is new about the vikings and so there are genuinely things that i find really fascinating but that are coming from research that's being done in 2017 and and later Mm. and including even some things that i don't think are even quite published yet in academic journals because journals take a long time to actually publish things yeah and there are these discoveries that were in fact just made in the last couple of years. Yeah, certainly the the module that I did at Copenhagen, a lot of the emphasis was a lot of the good information we have on Viking society is from archaeology because 
Yeah. The the Vikings didn't write things down. I mean, apart from, you know, mostly very short runic inscriptions. So there's not a lot to go on that's yeah. from their point of view. It's it's nearly all all from the the kind of the other side of the of the religious divide. So it's people exactly. who are naturally somewhat hostile to them. Actually what I wanted to I wanted to read out the bit of the Anglo Saxon chronicle describing uh, it's a very short section it's like a paragraph uh, describing the the attack on on the Lindisfarne uh, monastery because it, it yeah it's really cool it, in this year terrible portents appeared over the land of the northumbrians and wretchedly frightened the people there were excessive lightning fra- flashes and fiery dragons were seen flying in the air a great famine follow, soon followed these signs, and a little after that, in the same year, on the 8th of January, the harrying of the heathen men wretchedly destroyed God's church in Lindisfarne through plunder and slaughter. It's a it's a very metal description. <laughs> yes, and very evocative. Yeah. And also, one of the things, and this will come up more later, mm. but one of the things that I find really fascinating is that they are really clearly drawing on a lot of these accounts. Yeah, yeah. In ways that are, you know, that kind of then become even more striking as you do a little additional, you know, digging mm. and research. And so that particular description, you know, it really emphasizes these kinds of signs and portents and fears, which is then so interesting because in the, that's obviously something that's informing the description of the film, which is in some ways a little odd because oh, what yeah. you then have then visualized in the film is basically there's a thunderstorm and the monks are freaking the fuck out and think it's the apocalypse. Yeah. Apart from the abbot who's like, it's a thunderstorm. You've seen these before. It's not the end of the world. Which kind of makes me think that Athelstan, our future monk friend, does this every time there's a thunderstorm, making him slightly less brave than my dog. Yeah, which is which is stupid. I mean, we're not one of the more thundery, stormy places in the world, <laughs> but we get thunderstorms in the UK every summer. So, and he's he's not a six year old kid <laughs> who's never seen one of right. these before. Yeah, that was the right. weird thing he seems about like his. As an adult, you should be expecting it. Yeah, his his portrayal is is uh, sometimes he seems quite worldly, uh, but most most of the time he seems like somebody who just doesn't know anything and is extremely naive. Which, if he'd spend the whole time in in the cloister, would be sort of understandable. But it seems like well, they they make a point of saying that he he travelled to Scandinavia earlier in his life you know, and he's a young guy anyway, to to be a missionary. So yeah, it seems like if he'd seen a bit more of the world and traveled a bit more that he would be less like, oh, a thunderstorm. Ah, the apocalypse. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Based on his background, it really does seem like he should be a little bit more worldly and a little bit less anxious about thunder than he is presented as being in this early scene. The decision that they make, I will say that for a couple of these scenes, they have the monks speaking in... I couldn't quite make it out well enough to tell how accurate it was, but they Mm. have the monks speaking Anglo-Saxon and so speaking what sounds then like a foreign language because Anglo-Saxon, you know, sounds much more like German than it sounds like modern English. And then the Vikings, of course, are supposed to be speaking Old Norse, I guess, but we hear it as English, Yeah, which I think is really interesting and a kind of interesting reversal of uh, the kind of, you know, of the kind of position of the English speaking audience. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, later on, where you have the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings meeting on the beach, they actually have the Vikings speaking some Old Norse as well, so that so that it's kind of underlining, okay, no one understands each other here, and this is sort of how this develops from a tense sta- standoff into <laughs> a bloodbath. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, it was cool that they positioned it like that. I think right at the very beginning of the first episode, I think it comes in as them speaking Old Norse, but then it kind of very quickly kind of does a sort of hunt for Red October. It flips and you're like, okay, understand that you're hearing Old Norse, but you understand it because we've switched to English. Right, which I think is a good decision, honestly. Just another note about the attack itself, that they... They come across a monastery at Lindisfarne, and that's the main target of this first Viking attack in 793. And so you begin, therefore, to have the first of many, basically, Vikings making snarky comments about Christianity, which I'm going to be honest, I really enjoyed. 
And so the first really good one, I would say, is uh, I think Ragnar says upon looking around at the chapel, if this is their god, then he's dead. He's nailed to a cross when looking at a crucifix. Yeah, that would have seen, seemed super weird to the, the Vikings. And I guess if, you, if, if you'd never heard about Christianity it would seem a very odd decision that that's who you're going to worship. Meanwhile, back in Kattegat, which is the kind of main site that the Vikings are basically located in, the Earl is being just generally terrible as he's trying to find out more about exactly what happened with Ragnar. He also is increasingly presented as somebody who is basically being kind of violent for the sake of violence and, uh, you know, brutal for the sake of brutality. Yeah, I think it's it, it it's kind of like almost his society is developing more into kind of like a police state as he becomes more and more insecure about his position. He's just kind of like randomly murdering people to instill, instill fear. Like we have one of uh, Ragnar's band just kind of gets ambushed by the Earl's men and just, you know, has his has his throat cut. I think that happens a couple of times. But one of the guys yeah. who get, gets killed is, like, the most stereotypically Viking-looking guy ever. Oh, yeah. Ever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that, funnily enough, that actor is called uh, Vladimir Kulic, who, who turns out to be a Czech actor. So he's, he's hmm. uh, not someone who would, he would, you'd kind of assume that he was Swedish, but no, he's Czech. Right. Hmm. It is also in some of uh, Earl Haraldson's essentially mindless violence that we get, I would say, some of the really great gems from the close captioning that my TV provides. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which, because in this show in particular, it goes into a lot of detail about how it interprets the sounds. Mm. So one of the bracketed close captioning captions is, gurgled grunts as Sven repeatedly stabs Olafur, uh, Sven being... Yeah, uh, the Earl's right hand and Olafur being one of the various people he murders. Uh, yeah, Sven was, he was very much a, another let him die character. He's oh, kind of yeah. like, yeah, he's Earl Ul, Haldson's kind of right hand man and basically does all his dirty work. And he's also somebody that we never see him actually commit sexual assault. But we have a lot of scenes of him basically like creepily rubbing the arms of very young women. Mm, yeah, and leering. And things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's super he's, creepy. He's, he's gross. Yeah, definitely, definitely another big hashtag. Let him yeah. die. Moments. Yeah, his 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 death. Spoiler alert. Sorry, I should have done that the other way around. But when when he dies, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm not sad that this has happened. You kind of had this coming. Yeah. yeah. No, that one was pretty satisfying. Especially especially his look at look of disbelief. Like he just gets an axe like whacked into his chest, and he kind of looks down. And it's like. Oh, crap. This means I'm going to die now, doesn't it? And then he just keels over. <laughs> yeah, it's a solid scene. So uh, Ragnar returns with uh, too much acclaim from his raid. The Earl is very annoyed. This is when he gets to, you know, basically the Earl confiscates everything but allows each person to keep one thing. And Ragnar chooses the monk Athelstan, who, you know, speaks a bit of his language. And we then also have a lot of Ragnar and his family making fun of him for his tonsure and celibacy and just generally Christianity. Mm, I tell you what, though, trying to do a tonsure on yourself, that, that's got to be tricky. Yeah, and that, that was also pretty gross, to be honest, in a series, in a season with a lot of blood, the like him trying to shave his own head and like clearly not doing a very good job of no. it was... Eh. Ragnar then returns for a second raid, now with the Earl's... I guess I would say grudging permission, and apparently is now all but fluent in Anglo-Saxon in terms of how it's presented, but of mm. course none of the others speak a word of it, which unsurprisingly it leads to a lot of miscommunications. Yeah, the passage of time in this series is kind of, of fuzzy, but yeah, I... As someone who's attempted to learn several languages, the speed of his acquisition and fluency is uh, is enviable, to say the least. Right. I guess I would say that I feel like you could maybe get to that point if you're living in some place and really immersed. I mean, so to some extent, it makes sense that Athelstan has gone from speaking like a little bit of Old Norse to being completely fluent in it in that yeah. amount of time because he's, yes. basically, he's basically doing a, you know, immersion program. <laughs> Uh, and as immersion programs go, that's pretty much as, as intense as, as it gets. 
Right. <laughs> I, I'm not sure you'd be able to. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure you'd be able to market that to people. Hey, be the be the house slave of of, of somebody for a year. Ugh. Yeah, it's definitely not a marketable immersion program, but no. I will say there are little bits of the kind of him explaining his culture and his religion to these, you know, to the people who are now his masters, that obviously slavery is horrific. Yeah. They kind of, to some extent, sanitize it, I will say, by making Ragnar often have a kind of relatively positive relationship with Athelstan, with a couple of exceptions. Yeah, he generally says, uh, okay, yeah, technic technically you're my slave, but I'm not going to treat you like that for the most part. Which is like, right. yeah, it's, it's, it's still pretty horrible though, isn't it, Ragnar? You did, you know, kidnap this guy and murdered all of his, you know, colleagues. Right. And yeah, so they definitely do, I think, sanitize it. But then also very much make it so that these moments of him just, you know, explaining his culture and religion actually in some ways seem slightly familiar in terms of, you know, the kinds of interactions that you have when you are engaging with a, you know, a new and perhaps unfamiliar culture. Mm, yeah. Ragnar is back in England. He is smart enough to wait until Sunday for the raid. And so when they're all in church, they're going through town. And uh, I get another real good close captioning gem, which is uh, geese honk nervously. <laughs> because the, the geese apparently are as concerned about the Anglo-Saxons about the Viking raid. Yeah, yeah, they they, they can... <laughs> They can sense it. They, they have some kind of extrasensory <laughs> perception. Yeah. Floki, while they're in the church, it takes a sip of the communion wine, spits it out, and everyone gasps in horror, and then just sort of snorts and gulps down the rest. He then starts laughing hysterically and thinks this is very amusing. He is completely right. That's a great, very funny scene. I could definitely see why the congregation would have been completely scandalized though floki was was an interesting character because of all the characters that we meet he is the one who's like most strongly hostile to to christianity and is most concerned yeah. about any possibility that uh, that they will be betraying the uh, the norse gods which i thought was interesting because i mean i a lot of the problem with this is is that a lot of the the writing about the Norse gods is very late, so it's it's yeah. difficult to know authentically what people would have would have believed at the end of the eighth century slash beginning of the of the ninth. But I thought that whole insistence on like no, our gods are the true gods, and no other gods can be existent was possibly a, a bit weird for uh, for paganism, which tended to have a bit more of a attitude of like oh yeah well there can be other gods that we haven't heard of and we can just kind of co-opt them into the into the pantheon if we if we choose it was right i think vikings it wasn't hard to persuade them to adopt christ as one of their their gods but the the trick that the kind of like more established christian cultures had was being was the whole like no he's the one true god you can't just add him alongside thor and just call that a day right because that's very much what you'd expect that they'd be like yeah this jesus guy seems fine like we'll just yeah pop up a statue of him right now right over here between odin and thor yeah i mean hedge your bets right yeah but yeah and so i there is i would say a couple of places where it seems like his biggest concern is the idea that people are actually would be renouncing the viking gods and claiming to only accept jesus as their god which but which is what then that, that makes sense which is what the like christian church would be urging them to yeah. do but yeah a lot of syncretism did did go on so yeah so it definitely i would say downplays the syncretism quite a bit which is i think somewhat disappointing but i do appreciate that there is an emphasis on the fact that both the uh, christians and uh, the viking worshippers of the norse gods all take religion relatively seriously yeah definitely i mean there is kind of a varying degree across like all of the characters but all of them right. are somewhat serious like i thought king ayla was was like probably the most interesting version because like at one point to one of you know his own men that he has executed he's like well i don't think god's gonna raise you up because you're kind of a pathetic worm uh, that's <laughs> kind of paraphrasing but he's he, um but at another point you see him like very fervently praying and i actually looked it up yeah. and, and he's he's praying i think it's psalm 35 so he'd obviously got that memorized so he can kind of like you know pull that out of his hat when he's you know in a dire situation so yeah i i thought that was cool and i know 
that's something you've repeatedly taken note of is the fact that that everyone is a kind of like 21st century skeptical person who's been transported back 700 odd years. And I really appreciated that. I didn't think any of the characters actually struck me as that, that there are people mm. who religious faith is more important to them than to others. Yeah. And I think there's also a really interesting debate that happens at King Ayla's court where they're talking about, okay, so who are the Vikings? And some people think that they're sent by God as a punishment and some people that are think that they're sent by the devil just to, you know, mm. fuck with them. And some people are like, maybe they're just people and we just need to pay them off. Yeah. And I think that that debate and the fact that people have these different ideas, but that even the guy who thinks they're just dudes does ultimately still, I'm sure, you know, there's no reason not to think he doesn't have a, you know, some amount of faith in God. I mean, he is a bishop after all. Yeah, I think it really <laughs> works that you don't have these, uh, that you don't have any of these skeptics, that pretty much everybody has some acceptance of faith with Athelstan, I would say, being interesting as he kind of increasingly is having difficulties in terms of exactly how he sees his relationship to Christ and Christianity, and then to these Norse gods that he's getting exposed to and living amongst people who worship those gods. Yeah, and and rec reconciling his faith to the really bad experience that he's he's being being put through. Yes, that why would God allow this to happen to him? Because I'm so devout. I, I guess the one point I would say is that I thought it was perhaps an oversight is that is that all of the monks were extremely cowardly in in the face of death in the way that yeah yes you would definitely get some who would be really scared in the moment of well possibly most of them even i don't know i've i've never been fortunately i've never been in this situation where i've faced armed <laughs> heavily armed yeah. men who want to kill me so it's difficult to know but you would think with their belief or at least on paper being what it is that you'd have some who would be like less afraid of dying and more convinced that they that they're going to an afterlife than this perhaps shows yeah, I think that's a really good point, that Christianity, especially in this period, is very much a faith in which martyrdom is quite central, yes. with both the example of Jesus himself, and mm. the 8th century is still a period where there are people who are actively going places as missionaries with the expectation that they might then be martyred for their faith. Exactly, and they're, and they're churning out hagiographies in which saints, you know, bravely go... You know, I don't care if you kill me. If you if you strike me down, I will only become more powerful than you possibly imagine. Exactly. So yeah, so it's somewhat surprising that you don't have any examples, at least at this point of the series, of any of these uh, monks uh, embracing martyrdom. Yeah, yeah, that seemed like an oversight. On this raid also, uh, the Earl has this man, Canute, that he had sent with them, uh, Canute uh, tries to rape an Anglo-Saxon woman, Lagertha, who has come with them on this raid, uh, tries to stop him and successfully stops him, but then he tries to rape her and then she kills him, which, you know, good for her. I feel like I could have lived without this whole rape incident being the major instigating factor for several episodes of the season, but... Yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of the rapes that do happen throughout the run of the season, this seems like the the most, like, I guess situationally, they're on a raid and that's, you know, when sometimes in wartime well frequently in wartime these things would happen but at the same time the fact that he tries to rape lagatha just seems like a really dumb decision on the i mean obviously it's a horrible decision anyway but it's a really dumb decision by that character to like essentially try and rape one of his colleagues yeah and didn't really make sense to me not that people don't you know try and rape their colleagues of course that that happens uh, and it's and it's awful but it's the fact that he tries to rape somebody who the fact that she's on a raid it's clear that she can handle herself in a fight and you know she's married to the leader of the of the raid so it's just the fact that he it doesn't make sense that he would think that he would get away with this i mean maybe i'm being naive about rapist psychology here but i mean yeah and i don't want to discount the you know rapists are not necessarily making these kind of super intelligent rational decisions yeah. or anything like that but on the other hand it 
it seemed like a choice that didn't make sense to me and felt a little bit gratuitous in that it just seemed like it was, I don't know, it just seemed like it was a choice that was made really just to emphasize that, that even this kind of very powerful woman who has a lot of agency, who has a lot of real kind of physical strength and combat ability is still somebody that can potentially be you know, almost, you know, almost become a victim of rape and who is, uh, you know, the the survivor of an attempted rape. Mm. And uh, it just seemed, it seemed like a choice that I really could have lived without. Yeah, yeah, I think that's totally fair. She kills Canute, the, although Ragnar then ends up taking credit for this. The Earl is not happy and does not believe this whole rape story. It is at this point also that we get the first of Rolo's many almost betrayals and so this one is that the earl talks to rollo and rollo seems like he's basically going to agree to claim to be a witness and corroborate the earl's version of events which is that ragnar just murdered canute because he hated the earl and canute turns out to be his half brother or something yeah and then rollo basically implies that he's going to do this and in return is going to get to marry the earl's daughter and then when he's actually at the uh the thing the assembly ends up in fact corroborating his brother's story in your face earl haraldson you didn't see that coming yep the earl gratuitously murders one of ragnar's men at this point hard stab gurgled grunt is how this uh is described in my closed captioning say what you want but they're definitely doing doing their due diligence towards the uh hearing impaired uh, members of the audience i guess oh yeah i will say i i mean i don't know exactly how the process behind doing this closed captioning works but somebody clearly worked hard mm. on doing it for this particular show and i'm fairly impressed yeah yeah the earl then decides uh, after ragnar is uh you know demonstrated to be not guilty because you can legitimately kill a dude if he tries to rape your wife and so the earl then decides at this point that you know it's best to just at this point murder ragnar all of his family and everyone living in his village yeah all his neighbors who are just collateral damage yeah so there's some amount of the like this escalated a little quickly yeah and that seems it seems weird actually because a lot of at least my understanding of how being an earl or petty king in that time period worked was you kind of had support based on your ability to protect people in the surrounding area so yeah. if you start if you started like randomly murdering people then yes it would make people scared of you but they would probably just go okay it's not safe here i'm just going to i'm just going to leave or I'm going to find, you know, the nearest other military leaderish person who's not a psychopath and get him right. to sort you out. Right. And I think the choice to maybe kill men who are, or kill people who are probably in some ways connected with Ragnar and perhaps see him as their protector as being the kind of local warrior who's in the area. I think that is potentially reasonable as a way to kind of discredit Ragnar. Mm. Like, hey, he can't protect you, so maybe you should stop right. following him. But still, as I said, the whole thing does seem a little bit like it escalates rather quickly into just a lot of gratuitous murder. Mm. Yeah. And so Ragnar is injured and barely escapes and is brought eventually to Floki's. It is surprising that he survives, given that I'm pretty sure the fall that he takes into the water alone probably should have killed him, mm. not even getting into the stab wounds and the fact that this water, which is probably none too clean, is then getting into the stab wounds. Yeah, as as somebody who is work, who is right at this moment still in the process of recovering from like sur- abdominal surgery, this super kind of like <laughs> right. so- soft pedals how quick it is to recover from like chest wounds. Right, and yeah, and that's definitely something that I was kind of like, all right, I guess we're just gonna move along with this. Yeah, because I mean, of course, people did survive like nasty, nasty wounds. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of people didn't. Yeah. So he's in the process of uh, being uh, of being healed. Floki's uh, kind of seems to have something of a, you know, a bit of a medical expertise in terms of, you know, various kinds of remedies. Well, he's he's a he's a Norse wizard. Right, exactly. He's like Loki, only different. Yeah, there's a F at the beginning of his name. Yeah. I felt like I felt like that was I mean, I haven't looked it up to find out whether Floki was a common Norse name, but I didn't know whether they were just going, let's call him Floki because it kind of invokes Loki and that's kind of his tricksy 
kind of weird character. I didn't look up any of the names either in terms of how common or real they are as yeah. actual names, except for, of course, the people who are, in fact, either real people or at or... least real legendary figures. Yeah, yeah, pseudo-historical characters. Yeah. Right. One in addition to Floki that stuck out to me is that there's a guy whose name was House Carl. That's stupid, because that's like a name of a like military position with that would be somebody who would be kind of guarding the king or the earl in anglo-saxon england if i'm not mistaken right but that the way that he is being talked to it makes it seem like that's just his, his name name and not his position yeah right, right. i mean because it seems odd that the earl i mean that you know the earl would be then just talking to somebody and would just be calling him house carl as opposed to his name when he you know doesn't have that many attendants yeah that's a bit weird because i mean i know in like modern militaries you might address somebody as sergeant or as major but i don't think I don't think that's how Huskal worked. <laughs> no, and especially, I mean, in this period, you have like seven retainers. Just call them by their names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And Athelstan is really just helping, in quotes, uh, by quoting morbid sections of Ecclesiastes at them about how there's a time to be born and a time to die, which mm. really isn't very helpful. Although I think it is at this point where somebody basically says like, wow, your god's as dour as ours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I... I think you mentioned this in, in your notes. It's, it is pretty cool where you have them recount the, the legend of Ragnarok and how, and how that's going. And I guess in terms of people con converting uh, from uh, Norse paganism to Christianity, it's kind of like, yeah, I guess if you think the world is going to end by your gods going down in flaming defeat, that kind of makes other options more attractive. Right, which is fair. <laughs> Although I guess not that... I don't know, I guess neither faith has an especially cheery apocalypse story. Yeah, I guess. I guess it's, I suppose it's it's kind of on, yeah, the, the Christian apocalypse is really nasty if you're, if you're not a Christian. And right, Christianity at least has the out that if you're the kind of person who's ultimately going to get to go to heaven, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, and if you've and if you've died before the apocalypse actually happens, then you don't have to live through it. Earl Haraldson, meanwhile, has decided that the thing to do at this point to shore up his position is to marry his daughter, Theria, to the Swedish Earl Bjarni, who is approximately one million years old. <laughs> yeah, give or take. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he even goes so far as to say, like, we'll be very happy together, my dear child. Uh, not getting that the fact that he is calling his wife, my or future wife, my dear child, is exactly the problem. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's relatively historically accurate in terms of vast age, dis uh, you know, discrepancies being married off to each other. But it seems a weird decision to marry the daughter to somebody who doesn't look like he's going to be around for, you know, more than a couple of years. Or maybe that's the idea. That actually might be the idea. <laughs> it's like, just just put up with him for two or three years. He'll die. We'll get to inherit his lands in Sweden and it'll all be worth it. Except for you, who have to sleep with him. But, you know, that's beside the point. Right. That, I, I don't think it's entirely unrealistic, but it's definitely gross. And, oh, super uh, gross. And they yeah. really underline the grossness. Oh, yeah. And uh, so Fury is obviously not happy. Siggy is also not happy. And I think that the she kind of makes a comment that she's upset in part that she just doesn't like this whole situation because, mm. you know, she gives a shit about her daughter. Yeah. But also that she is annoyed about the fact that she wasn't consulted. And I'd have to double check some details about exactly what we would know about Viking women, but that actually doesn't mm. seem unrealistic to me that women in general in a number of places in the medieval world did expect to be consulted about their daughter's marriages, that this was something that they considered themselves to have a kind of role and to take part in that kind of family arrangements. Mm. Not that women necessarily then would be kind of standing up for their daughters not having to marry unattract, you know, creepy older, you know, creepy elderly men, but that the idea that they get to weigh in and that it is a disrespect to them that they don't get to, that doesn't seem entirely unreasonable to me. Mm -hmm. And definitely the one of the points that was made in some of the reading that, that I did is because of the raiding and trading nature of Viking society, you did have the men off for long periods of time. And basically that sort of arrangement wouldn't really work unless as the men doing that, you trusted your wives to be responsible adults when <laughs> when you were right. away it, you know because i suppose if you're if you're there all the time it's easier to get away with the like 
no, I'm the grown up and you're you just have to do what I say, which is obviously gross, but it's it's much harder to make that argument when when you're kind of having to leave people in charge. Right. And uh... You know, and that's also, I would say, not even exclusive to the Vikings, that no, it's fairly no. common that uh, among European royalty, uh, that they would leave their wives in charge when they were, you know, when they were away for various reasons. Yeah. So the idea that it was always dreadful all the time to be a woman in the Middle Ages and you were treated like a child everywhere is massively simplistic. Yeah, and I will say, except for the gratuitous rape, there are things that I think are not badly done about mm. the role of elite women in mm. this show. She's marrying this disgusting dude who also, charmingly, I believe, threatens to beat her if she doesn't get her get him some pickled herrings. In uh, bed. Mean, in bed. Yep, I mean, great. You've got to spice up your sex life somehow. Ooh. Yeah, well, yes, it, yes. Then he also, he actually suggests like, well, maybe if I beat you, then you'll be livelier in bed. And it's like, oh God, can we not do this? Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, it's obviously the series is painting him as a disgusting guy who you're going to be pleased yeah. when he dies. But yeah. Rollo is uh, imprisoned by the Earl and tortured and uh, given some, some Joker scars, basically, mm. for not talking enough. And in fact, does not give up Ragnar under torture, which... I was surprised by, I will say. And uh, Ragnar then hears of this and decides that a really good idea, despite the fact that he is still uh, grunts in pain every time he stands, which my close captioning made sure to point out. It didn't that say <laughs> grunts in pain in brackets every time he stands up for this scene. But uh, despite the fact that that is the state that he is in, he decides it's a great idea to challenge the Earl to single combat. Which it, it, It's fine. Yeah. He's super old. Right, exactly. This is the kind of thing that, honestly, I assumed he would win because he's the main character. But other than that, I was like, this does not have, we do not have any reason to expect that this is going to go well, other than, yeah, this, you know, Yeah, exactly. That, that, is, that, is the only, that is the only way that he wins this, is because he, he is mandated to by the fact he's the main dude. Right. He does end up, uh, it, I would say it ends up being then portrayed as ultimately a pretty close and fair fight between the two of them but Ragnar eventually does defeat and kill and kill Haraldson. So Sven, his second in command, then orders the men to kill Ragnar because he just killed the Earl but that's not actually how it works. The assumption is kind of that if you kill the Earl you're probably the Earl now. Especially when he's challenged you to single combat. Right, that it was that everything was done in a very appropriate and above board way. He had every right to kill the Earl, essentially. The Earl basically agreed to the possibility of Ragnar killing him. Yeah. And so Sven has no grounds for ordering Ragnar to be killed, and then Rollo stabs him, which is very satisfying. Yes. Hashtag let him die. Hashtag <laughs> let him die. And hashtag let him die bonus. Siggy then stabs and kills Bjarni, her son-in-law, like, immediately. Yeah. Showing that, I guess, for her, this whole thing is kind of a wash, ultimately. I mean, she's she's very, like, no, when Ragnar is, is finishing off uh, uh, the Earl uh, by slitting his wrist. But, yeah. It's just Which like, I well, assume is somewhat genuine. I mean, there's reason to think that she, with the exception of the whole marriage thing more or less liked her husband and they had a kind of adequate working relationship yeah they're they're, they're portrayed as being as yeah having some degree of mutual respect and there's there there there's definitely an, an age gap but it's not a insane age gap it's not like her daughter and earl bjarni no no they give haraldson a fancy funeral which includes mm. his slave being gang raped by his men and then murdered we'll talk about that later yes uh, yes Siggy asks permission to light the funeral pyre, but is denied this right, which is a kind of sign of dishonor. She initially then kind of is like, all right, we better take off. And Rollo ultimately convinces her to stay. And at the funeral, Lagerta tells Ragnar that she's pregnant and that they're going to have another child who presumably, like their current children, will be very blonde. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I, I want to say the, uh, the their kid, Bjorn, is he is an example of a good kid actor. He does yeah, a good he's pretty good. Good. I think he overall kind of delivers, he delivers lines in a kind of good sort of matter of fact way. He also, I didn't look him up, but um, assuming he's not putting on an accent, which mm. as I said, most people aren't, he is, I assume, not a native English speaker. Yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't, I, 
If I did look him up, I don't remember. Yeah, and so assuming that's his real accent, then that would be my guess. And Mm. if that's the case, honestly, I'm pretty impressed at the fact that at his age, which is, I don't know, 15 or something, in terms of how old the actor probably is, I'm impressed that he can do that good of a job delivering lines and acting in a foreign language. Yeah. They return to Northumbria and another attack. And meanwhile, he leaves Ligerta in charge. So as we were talking about before, that this is, you know, considered to be standard. And she also, I am entertained by this, excuses... So there's a woman who is accused of adultery because she and her husband have been infertile for a long time. And then she gets pregnant, right? Or, you know, gives birth to a child nine months after some uh, some dude showed up. And... Lagarta's explanation of how she, in fact, should be honored and not executed for adultery is that, oh, that dude that showed up uh, based on his name, he was really the god Himdal. And uh, so, you know, you should be thrilled about this, which honestly, I think is pretty clever. Yeah. And and it's and it's the Earl's wife, so it's pretty difficult yeah. to argue. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Heimdall's played by Idris Elba in Thor, so honestly, you know, good for that kid. Yeah, yeah. Got a cool dad. The Vikings uh, back in uh, Northumbria sneak attack at night to defeat the English and end up capturing the king's brother Athelwolf, uh, who is quite actually praying quite intensely for a while before he goes out, which I thought was an interesting scene, again, going back to how, you know, these people are taking religion seriously. Mm. But prayer does not ultimately help him as the defeat and his eventual capture is made all the easier by the fact that Floki, you know, knocks down the tent on top of him while he's in the middle of praying. Yeah, I mean, I guess because night attacks were super, super risky at the time, I guess that's the only reason you can say that's why he was praying and not actually like watching out for being attacked. But yeah. yeah. Because they've captured the Earl or the King's brother, they end up being then called upon to actually negotiate. Although I do enjoy that when they're kind of talking about what to do about this situation. One of the people at the court says evil cannot be accommodated nor yet ever bargained with, which is basically medieval for we won't negotiate with terrorists. Yeah, pretty much. They're invited for dinner. There's a little overemphasis in this scene on the Anglo-Saxons as being civilized and the barbar- and the Vikings as being barbarians. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not sure I buy that the way people in Anglo-Saxon England ate was so traditionally civilized in appearance. Yes, it's not as if people had knives and forks. I mean, yeah, yeah. you had, like, a dagger to cut stuff, but yeah. The Vikings probably also had a dagger to cut stuff. yeah. And, and that whole business about plates and these are fun to throw on the floor and smash seemed a bit a, w- a bit weird as well. Yeah, so that definitely, I would say, felt like it was overly kind of hammering home this idea of the Vikings as being barbaric relative to the Anglo-Saxons. Yeah, you kind of think that they would sort of be on their best behavior because they're in a vulnerable situation. But not at all, which I imagine is to some extent based on an assumption ultimately, which makes sense plot wise in that Ragnar yeah. certainly is extremely arrogant, that yeah. he genuinely believes that if the Anglo-Saxons get up and attack him, that they'll win. Yeah. I'm sure they're all still armed. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's just you'd think that they would be they would be careful about drinking too much because that's how you get kind of taken advantage of that's how you get red weddinged oh exactly yes (laughs) (laughs) the anglo-saxons eventually agree that they will pay a pretty hefty ransom for the king's brother but so that they can actually take them at their word they require that one of the vikings get baptized and rollo agrees to this the baptism is hysterical as he clear as he just keeps trying to like shy away and being like, what the fuck are you doing? Stop touching me while they are trying to like anoint him. Yeah, this was so this was so dumb. You'd kind of think that someone would have briefed him as to what he was going to having accepted that he's going to be going through this ritual this is what to expect uh, rather than just assuming, oh yeah, he's going to be totally cool with what whatever we do to him right you'd think that and the other thing i will say that i did find somewhat odd about it especially after seeing the scene at the viking temple of Uppsala in the next episode Mm. it's not that different in certain ways in terms of Mm. that there's a kind of expectation that when you're undergoing certain kinds of religious rituals that you have a priest and he kind of like you know touches you and puts various liquids on you you follow direction yeah yeah And so it doesn't seem like they necessarily would have found baptism to be quite as weird as he apparently does. But him kind of like 
giving the bishop these looks every time the bishop tries to touch him is pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, and 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 they really contrast the physical type because Rollo is a strapping guy and the bishop is kind of like a weedy cleric kind of. Yeah, like... yeah, who's like a foot shorter than him, basically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Floki is, this is kind of what we were talking about before, Floki is very grumpy about the fact that Rollo has renounced the gods. And, yeah. you know, by, in terms of the kind of ritual, that is technically what he's done. Technically, he has agreed to no longer worship the Norse gods, and Floki's very concerned about this being something that will make Odin angry with him. The English, in fact, are the ones that then decide to break their word, despite the fact that all of this kind of rigmarole about like, oh, we have to baptize this dude so we can trust you. Yeah, that that seemed ill thought out on 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 their part. They don't they don't seem to be very concerned about keeping keeping their word. Right. Which, as I said, you know, not that I think everybody always keeps their word all the time. It's not unreasonable no. or impossible that that's the choice they would have made. But it did just seem bizarre that there's so much of an emphasis on, well, we have to do this so we can trust you. And that, of course, they're the ones who ultimately are not trustworthy. Yeah. Well, and the fact that they would believe that just like forcing somebody to get baptized automatically means that they're totally sincere about it and that they're not going to renege the minute they get out of <laughs> out of the... Uh... Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is still a you know, society where I think they're pretty much aware that Christianizing is a complicated endeavor. So Rollo uh, then does in this ensuing battle, murder a lot of Christians to make up for his baptism and starts yelling at Floki about, do you think Odin's still angry at me as he's stabbing at at some, what is basically, I think at that point, a corpse? Yeah, basically anyone who's on the battlefield and not quite dead yet, Rollo goes goes around making sure that they're not going to get better. While they're gone, Lagerta has a miscarriage of, Ragnar, when he gets back, is genuinely upset, which I appreciated, but also Mm. increasingly at this point found him really irritating as he began to just be like extremely kind of sulky and self-centered and very not engaged with like comforting or having any kind of emotional connection with his wife, who is clearly also very upset. Mm, Yeah, he it seems to read much more. He's upset not because this happened to the person that he loves. It's more that oh, I thought I was going to get another son and now I'm not going to. That's how I read it. Yeah, I yeah, that's completely how I read it as well. And that, as I said, that he really doesn't seem at all interested in the fact that this is, A, something that's traumatic that happened to her and involving her body, but also mm. that even beyond that, this is at the bare minimum a loss that is a loss of a child for both of them. Yeah, yeah. So, and that began the process of uh, Ragnar increasingly getting some hashtag let him dies from me. Yeah, that's that's fair. They plan to go to the temple to the gods at Uppsala for a festival to sacrifice to the gods and for Ragnar and Lagerta to follow up with asking the gods about their whole, like, supposed to have many sons thing that Mm. uh, had been prophesied to Ragnar in the past. Athelstan dramatically goes to look at his copy of the Gospels and sees that it is now completely fallen apart, which I definitely had this, like, historian, I look at manuscript moments of, like, oh, God, it was such a nice book and you've ruined it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Especially, you know, a Lindisfarne produced, yeah. illuminated. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, oh, God, t- take better care of that. That could have lasted forever. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, it's like, what did you do? dude right did you like spill spill water all over it and then like leave it outside (laughs) right i mean because it would have been on uh on vellum or animal skin Mm. you know parchment and it's a pretty durable material honestly i mean we have hence we we still have them yeah (laughs) exactly we have a lot of manuscripts from this period that are in quite good shape honestly Mm. Because yeah. this is, they're, they're fairly, you know, especially compared to books as they're produced today, are extremely durable. Mm. Well, and the I guess the irony is, probably the more he was using it, the worse condition it would get in. So if he was right. just, if he was just <laughs> not doing his daily devotions, it would probably be in better shape. Right. It's clearly, like, symbolic of his neglect of Christianity. Yes. That the yeah. book is now falling apart. Yes, probably, probably better that we don't interrogate it <laughs> that hard. I don't think we're yeah. meant to. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's symbolism. Yes. At the festival, he spends a lot of time pretending that he is no longer a Christian and denies God three times. In a very significant moment, yeah. Yes, it's very, you know, 
It's like, all right, we're, we're doing the biblical referent to St. Peter here. That's, mm-hmm. that's good. Gets super high, having an interesting time. I think he has sex with the with a fairy, the Earl's daughter. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't remember. He certainly has sex with somebody. Yeah. She's, she's certainly kind of pulling him along at some point. I think they might have, I think they have sex. He, he, is, he definitely has sex mm. with somebody. Yeah. And is kind of going hard on this whole, like, I guess I'm going to ditch Christianity thing until the priests indicate that they're that the reason he's here, by the way, is oh, didn't you know where we're, we're going to sacrifice you? Yeah, um, to which she's <laughs> kind of like, uh, okay, so so much for me not being a slave, Ragnar. Not that he actually says that, but pretty uh, much. <laughs> and then also like pulls out a cross real quick. <laughs> yeah, that he's just been hiding on his person, and they're like, ha, we knew you weren't sincere, ma ha ha ha. Which is a good move, and uh, so then, you know, I it was entertained that Ragnar just goes, oh, looks like your god finally came through for you. Yeah. And somebody else then gets sacrificed in his stead. Yeah, vol- volunteers. Yeah, volunteers. Floki, I think, tries to, and his girlfriend's like, yeah, fuck no. <laughs> yeah. Ragnar then also meets with the king, Horvik. And uh, they make an agreement to join forces on future raids to both uh, England and to Frankia, the Kingdom, uh, the kingdom which is referred to as being in much better shape and much richer than England, which is fair. Yeah, most places were. Yeah. Not Scandinavia, though. <laughs> Not Scandinavia. Ragnar also then agrees to go as the king's emissary to ask uh, his enemy, or the king's enemy, Jarl Borg, to give up his claims on some land that the king owns, but that Jarl Borg says he owns, and the king basically says, tell him to give up my give up his claims, then I'll give him some money. Yeah, this definitely, King Horvik definitely seems like a Machiavellian type, so it seems like, wait, I'm gonna send Ragnar over there, because on the one hand, it might achieve what I want it to achieve, but if Jarl Borg gets angry and kills him, then it just means that this guy, who's a, potentially a bit of a threat, gets murdered and I don't have to worry about him anymore. Right, and also the whole thing is that, you know, clearly has some kind of Machiavellian undertones as well, and that it's pretty it's pretty apparent very quickly that the king's ultimate aim is that he kind of, I think, assumes that Jarl Borg is probably not going to actually take this deal, and that he is not interested in or willing to negotiate further, and is pretty happy with the idea of them eventually having a war. Yeah, he, th- he thinks he's probably going to win this one. So basically, they kind of show up, things go to a standstill very quickly, Floki is sent off to go back to the king to clarify instructions, and uh, the rest of the party goes off to basically see a cool sacred tree, and Rollo is left behind as something of a hostage. And this is where Jarl Borg immediately is like, so you hate your brother, huh? Yeah, I can see that sign around your neck that says, (laughs) I don't like Ragnar very much and I'm jealous of him. Yeah, and Ragnar's like, I love my brother, and Jarl Borg is like, do you though? Well, when I finish with him. We have a lot of those scenes of them kind of playing whatever the like Viking version of chess is and uh, musing on their poor relationships with family members. <laughs> yes. And uh, Ragnar, while off in the woods, uh, runs into some woman who is just bathing naked with some attendants for oh. no apparent reason. Oh, it's well it's his it's Ragnar's servants who come across yeah. this extremely leggy blonde who's who's bathing in clear sight of the road. Right. And then says, you know, oh well you need Ragnar to apologize to me because uh, you know you saw me bathing and he does this whole thing where she has to like follow some riddle and then show up not dressed or undressed and not alone or accompanied etc and she you know shows up like wearing a fishnet and bringing a wolf which the dog is cool hall yeah. give her that and and eating an onion right so eating an onion so she's not neither hungry nor full etc they start having sex like really quickly this is my let him die moment with ragnar where i'm just like nope done with you yeah yeah definitely let him die all caps i think yep yeah yeah fuck ragnar Bjorn, I will appreciate because Bjorn has definitely had some moments of like kind of being a dick and his mm. mother is like keeping him in line and I really appreciate that Bjorn is basically immediately like, yeah, fuck you, dad. Yeah. <laughs> for cheating is... on my mother. Because, yeah, Bjorn has not been totally sympathetic because he has been kind of like, Athelstan, we're going to totally murder you because you're a Christian and I don't like you. Yeah. But, you know, he's like 13. 13 year old boys as a group uh, are, are kind of, murd- kind of assholes. Uh, moody and filled with bloodlust. Yeah. Yeah. 
Right. Sounds about right. Yeah. And so, you know, this went a long way toward me having a more positive view of Bjorn as being like, okay, like a basically 13 year old privileged kid and being kind of a jerk. But I really appreciated this loyalty that he showed to his mother that he, you know, basically as soon as he found out that his dad is sleeping with this woman and by found out, I mean, saw because it was like right in the same hut that they're all sleeping in. He yeah. you know, goes and says like, he actually says like, I hate you, dad. <laughs> And, and and his dad is just just like ruffles his ruffles his hair and it's like oh bless you yeah and Bjorn actually makes him promise that, that he won't have sex with her again which yeah we'll see how that goes yeah so meanwhile then back at I guess are they back at Katagat I um, believe so yes yeah so meanwhile there's some sort of plague and since we've introduced a new female character for Ragnar to sleep with we can then kill off two of the other female characters. So both Theory and Gita, um, mm. which is Ragnar and Ligurta's daughter, die. Well, it was just going to be too much like hard work to develop yet more female characters, right? I know, God forbid. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so that was a choice that was made. Yeah, that was gross. It, it was really gross. I also was like, oh, like this is like really horrible. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with Siggy's character. But I'm, but like, there's been, there was a, we didn't really talk about this, but there was a lot made of the fact that there, that her and Earl Haraldson's two sons had previously been killed. Yeah. Yeah. And so this sense, like, all of her kids are dead. Yeah. And her this husband is as well. And she's basically alone in the world now. Except for Rollo, which is really not the best bet. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> You've got Rollo, who at the pagan festival is totally excited about getting it on with random other people who are at the at the festival and that Siggy just has to lump it because he's he's a red-blooded man and that's what he's gonna do and if she doesn't like it she should find somebody else yep which she pretty much says to her so, yeah great thanks Rollo. yeah uh, although uh, how she responds to that is is brilliant I know we're jumping around a bit but when she totally points out that if Rollo was as important that, as he thinks he was he would be having a conversation with King Hor- Horvick, like his brother is. Yes, and also even suggests that, by the way, if you hadn't been out fucking a bunch of random woman- women, then you would have been here, and I, who knew about this whole meeting, would have told you about it, and you could have gotten yourself into it if you'd known about it. Yeah, your loss. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, and maybe so... Maybe you aren't such a clever yeah. logs. Yeah, and so that's definitely a moment I will say that I also appreciated, yeah. in that she's... A figure who, again, I think I think they do an adequate job on the whole of without having these women be these kind of modern feminists stuck into the Middle Ages, that you have these women who have a high respect for themselves and their own abilities. And, uh, you know, she's very much somebody who's going to try to maneuver to be in the kind of best to kind of put herself and her daughter in the kind of best possible situation, which yeah. includes this kind of like being willing to make this threat, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, and not just be meek and sit back and just be passively letting things happen to them. As it turns out, Ragnar finds out that Aslog is pregnant. The embassy basically breaks down with the assumption that war is going to be starting imminently. And Rollo finally, officially, betrays Ragnar. So at this point, I'm I'm going to do a couple of two solid uh, let him dies for both Rollo. <laughs> not for the betrayal, just kind of in general. Yeah kind of blanket yep and uh for ragnar i would i'm sure this is not probably what's going to happen but i would love to see ligurta just like just slit his throat next episode so or at the beginning yeah. of next season yeah although if as as you're uh familiar with the, with the sources that at the end of i think it's episode six we do get a heavy if you already know how this ends foreshadowing of of how uh ragnar may end up as we see. Right. Uh, maybe we refer to that again later. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so that's where we are at the end of the first season, and, uh, well, we will all see what happens in the second. Indeed. Yeah. Stay tuned. So for our next segment, Vera at Falso, we talk about specifically what they got right and what they got wrong. And... This is, as we kind of alluded to before, very much a series where I appreciate that somebody clearly actually did research. There's a couple of things that we've talked about already. I do just want to make a special note of the fact that the Viking warriors are not wearing horned helmets, which Thank is correct. Thank goodness. Yes. 
thank goodness this is the kind of big thing that people who teach courses on the Vikings get like very annoyed about. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is apparently the main thing that uh, one of the faculty members at my graduate university really wanted students to get out of his course on the Vikings was that the Vikings didn't wear horned helmets. Yeah, I remember hearing some story about like a, a academic book on on vikings that was that was published by a more like large corporate publishing house and they went and stuck some horned helmeted guys on the front much to the chagrin of of all the academics (laughs) whose work was contained within there it's like ah great thanks very Mm much 19th century history people and your imagination yep so uh, that is a very common uh, misconception, which it was nice to see not reproduced here. Yeah, they don't wear much uh, at all in the way of uh, of helmets. It's the Anglo Saxons have them, and they to me look very Norman y to me. But uh, but yeah, right. The Vic- er, the Anglo Saxons armor seemed a bit late to me, but I will say that I think it does. It does actually seem right to me that they have a little bit more in the way of armor than the Vikings would have in this period. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, I think that's fair. The other thing that I would say overall they do pretty well, and at least in that kind of first episode, is in presenting the kind of legal system and the importance of the assembly. Hmm. So as distracting, honestly, as it was to just hear the thing, the kind of which is <laughs> in that, you know, that is an English word that has a kind of meaning of a kind of, yeah, you know, the thing. I was at the thing. Yeah, it kind of well, sounds silly, but that is actually what it was called. And I mean, also, if you're a, a fan of the, the John Carpenter remake from like 1980, you're imagining it's a shape-shifting alien is going to come and off all these Vikings. <laughs> right. So it sounds a little silly that they're just like, oh, yeah, I was at the thing. <laughs> but that is in fact uh, what it was called. Yeah, the yeah. Uh, communal assembly that also functioned as a court, and yeah. I think it also they do a good job of the community overall being involved in justice. Yeah, they have a big emphasis on the fact that killing people isn't necessarily a problem. It's that not taking immediate public responsibility for the for the killing is the bigger problem. Yeah, yeah, it's like there are certain cir- circumstances like self defense that it's acceptable, but if you if you're all clandestine about it then people will tend to assume that it wasn't in self-defense right and i thought they did a good job as emphasizing that they do i think ultimately make the decision to have the punishments themselves be somewhat more i guess i would say cinematic in terms Mm. of how they're then visualized the most common punishment seemed to have been having somebody pay a fine or being outlawed Mm. and instead they go with basically somebody being like pelted with rotten fruit in the streets in punishment for theft and then execution for the person who is found guilty of murder. Yeah, although they definitely portrayed that as this is Earl uh, Haraldson has kind of manipulated the kind of quote unquote democracy of the thing in order to get this conviction. He's kind of like put his thumb on the scales there and and especially when he like he curses the guy after he's had his head chopped off when it's basically like being portrayed up until that point where it's kind of like it's just like we're just soberly meeting out justice and then there's this kind of really emotional this wasn't what we signed up to and everyone's everyone's kind of like visibly disturbed that yeah and this is a moment where i think and so this is actually bjorn is at this first uh this is his first thing where he kind of officially you know it's, you know, basically his, like, Viking bar mitzvah. He becomes a man and he gets his arm rings. And gets to see someone die gruesomely. In fact, that's <laughs> probably... to see someone gruesomely die. In fact, that's probably why Lagatha, because Lagatha is like, eh, I think he's still too young. I don't think he should go yet. And it's kind of like, if this is the sort of things that happens there, yeah, maybe maybe you do want to keep him from seeing that straight away. Right, you don't want your 13-year-old to go somewhere where he's going to watch, you know, watch a brutal execution and then also yeah. be like, like, they also get him really drunk, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think they do err in favor of having punishments that have kind of better visuals than, you know, Mm. somebody handing over, you know, handing over some cash. Yeah. You know, but I think they do also, they're kind of making the claim that Earl Haraldson is kind of transitioning into being a more kind of capricious and cruel ruler. So parts of it make sense. I do want to give a shout out to the show for this finally of the many, many Viking funerals that I have seen while watching and covering movies for Media Evil. This is the (laughs) first one in which a ship burial involving burn, involving the burning of the ship and the cremation of the deceased this is the first time that's actually a setting in which that is a 
feasible thing that potentially could have happened. Yeah. So shout out to them. Although I do want to note that that was not always the choice made by Vikings for burials, that they seem to have had a kind of range of different practices and with uh, burial was something that would have coexisted with these cremations. Yes. And, and often it was done in a mound on land rather yeah. than sending it out to, and out to sea. Right, exactly. So uh, that obviously they make the choice in this to have that be the specific way the funeral happens because of this spectacle. But props where props are due. This is yeah. the first setting in which I've seen that kind of funeral where it is at least a possible option that this particular group of people would have chosen for the funeral of an elite. Yeah, and they've not randomly transposed it into a Christian context and just gone, exactly. well, it looks damn cool, doesn't it? Exactly. So I appreciate that. I also want to note that the rather disturbing scene in which one of Haraldson's slaves is selected to be basically gotten drunk, sent around to his men to be gang raped, and then slaughtered by a crone known as the Angel of Death is in fact at least something that comes from a what is purportedly a first-hand account of the funeral of a Viking chieftain in Rus, I believe. Yes, yeah, it was yeah. Um, It was a chronicle of, from, uh, I think, Baghdad originally. I think it was, I want to say it was Ibn Fadlan. Yeah, Ahmad Ibn Fadlan. So it's a 10th century, uh, basically kind of civil servant and traveler who is, um, uh, you know, so who is kind of based in Baghdad, but who um, apparently then witnesses this kind of funeral of a chieftain where this is done in Rus. So it's one of the many things where we have a lot of these kind of accounts that are not from the Viking perspective. And so it's sometimes unclear exactly to what extent they might be perhaps kind of sensationalized. Yeah. Do you ever listen to the In Our Time uh, podcast? It's like, it's actually a BBC Radio 4 radio program that they also put out as a podcast. But a, a few years ago, they did an episode on uh, Volga Vikings slash the mm -hmm. Rus, and they talked extensively about this Ibn Fadlan yeah. account. And they said that that there have been burials that have been found with a whole bunch of, of yes. skeletons in them that is consistent with this this account. So obviously you can't know about the sexual rape element, but you know right. the other aspects kind of tally with the with the archaeological evidence. So it sounds like right. reasonably legit. Right. And relatedly archaeological evidence certainly does confirm in general that the Vikings practiced human sacrifice, which is something that for a while historians questioned whether that was something in general that was a real practice or a kind of Christian accusation or a kind of Christian and Muslim accusation that was made yeah. against the Vikings. And it's been confirmed, I think, pretty securely based on the archaeological evidence that this probably was something that the Vikings practiced. Mm. And so, yeah, as we said, it, as I said, it's, as we discussed, you know, it's not impossible that there are some elements of this particular sacrifice of the enslaved woman that have been somewhat sensationalized but it is an account that's coming from a real place that is very possibly accurate in many of its details unfortunately yeah yeah it's just not necessarily something that would happen in scandinavia at this time right. because it's it's removed both in terms of time and place but i guess they yes. the writers just thought like this is too cinematic and too sensational an element not to want to use it yeah and i would say in general the in some ways and i'll talk a little bit more about the details behind this but in some ways one of the kind of biggest quibbles that i have with this in terms of accuracy is the fact that they really kind of play fast and loose in terms of dates Mm, and definitely. so that has to do with a couple of kind of specific events and individuals. But also I would say that they're pretty willing for the sake of the show. They've clearly done their research, but they're basically fine with, okay, if we've attested a certain practice in any account of the Vikings in any precise time or place, then it's fair game for inclusion in this, even exactly. if there's no reason to particularly link it to 8th century Scandinavia. Yeah, which I guess if you're making a show that you want people to watch, you can understand the temptation. It's at least, I would say, an understandable decision. There are a lot of things that I've seen where they take liberties with historical realities in ways that I just don't understand why they made the choices that they made. Mm. This at least, I think, is an understandable choice that, okay, we, you know, have some reason to think based on medieval documentation that Vikings did this at some point. 
we want to include it, let's put it in. It's not something that a historian would do if writing an actual history, obviously. No. But historical fiction, I don't think, has to be held to quite the same standards. And I don't think that that's an entirely unreasonable choice. Yeah. Similarly, by the way, the scene at the Temple of Uppsala, where there's the sacrifice of nine males of a number of different species, including, of course, people, mm. that this dates from an 11th century account by a German monk, Adam of Bremen, who claims that, in fact, this was a practice at specifically the Temple of Uppsala. Yes. Yes, yeah. I'd seen that as well. So again, something that we don't know exactly to what extent it's accurately representing events and to what extent he is potentially kind of sensationalizing it, but it's consonant with archaeological evidence to some degree that there were, you know, at least occasionally human sacrifices, and uh, it's something that they're at least drawing on a text, which is an account of these events. Yeah. The presentation of the Vikings, especially from the English perspective, as being these kind of dangerous barbarians is I think an interesting choice in that, as we talked about a little bit, I think to some extent they exaggerate the gulf between the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings. But I think that that is consonant with how the Anglo-Saxons themselves describe the Vikings. Mm, yeah. I guess. If you kind of think of that, if you kind of think of that division as being from the English perspective, then I'll kind of give them that that is how the English saw things. Yeah. Although I guess like culturally... Obviously, there was the religion thing, but in terms of the way that their societies were organized and just ethnically what most people would have looked like. Yeah. And even the language that they spoke. Like, my understanding was that Old old Norse and Old English were similar enough that if you took the time, you could make yourselves understood with each other. Um, oh, absolutely. That's actually... I believe, uh, I I have not looked this up. This is my kind of vague memory from an old English class that I took when I was a sophomore in college, so mm. a very long time ago at this point. But I believe there are at least scholars who think that the reason the English language stopped having case endings is actually because there were people who were in what is now England who were speaking some number of different languages, including kind of Anglo-Saxon and Old Norse and yeah. Old Danish. And the big difference between the languages and the thing that made it hardest to communicate were the fact that their case endings were all different. And so they kind of just stopped using case endings. Yeah, which having learned Russian, which has case endings, I can definitely understand the temptation to just be, go be like, uh, those are hard work, I'm not going to do them. Right. And that does make sense that if that's the kind of big barrier to being able to kind of make yourself understood between a number of different cognate languages, that I could kind of see that being the sort of thing that would maybe then fall by the wayside. Yes. Yeah, I, I had heard, I'd heard the same thing el elsewhere. So I don't know whether it's like the most up-to-date linguistic theory, but I'd certainly heard, heard right. that elsewhere. In reality, I think that the division, that the really, the kind of biggest cultural division between the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons at this exact period probably is the kind of paganism versus christianity yeah and that other things in terms of you know things like how you eat and, and attitudes toward war and mili in the military i'm not i don't think there really would have been as much of a gulf as is being claimed here yeah but the vike the are the anglo-saxon monks and bishops who are writing chronicles about the viking attacks are very invested in presenting the vikings as being far less civilized than they are Yes, yeah, definitely. I don't know whether this would be an appropriate time to mention the English attitude about like, oh, well, these Vikings, well, these these heathens have been sent as a punishment from yeah. God for our sins. That's definitely something that's reflected in the in the in the sources. Um, yeah, absolutely. Alcuin, who was um, an Anglo-Saxon monk who had ended up. Uh, at the court of Charlemagne, which is in, which is just an interesting point in itself, in that mm -hmm. you know our assumption about the medieval world and especially the early Middle Ages is that people stayed put, apart from you know if you were a Viking. But no, if right. you were if you were an educated, I guess it's an anachronistic term, but professional, then mm -hmm. you, you know you had the potential for moving around. So he he wrote an account that was very much like yeah. This is this is why this has happened. It's because the the Northumbrians aren't following Christianity properly, and God is 
using the Vikings as an instrument to discipline them, essentially. Right. So, the, the, yeah, I, I definitely got the impression that the writers of this series had read that account as well. Yeah, and again, I think there there are so many moments, I would say, throughout this series where you can really, you're like, oh, okay, I see what you read and where that came from. Yeah, and I mean, and to be fair, it's a it's an Old Testament from a Christian perspective uh, motif slash right, of course. You know, in, in the in the, I mean, it's very much the kind of way that uh, pretty much everything is presented in First and Second Kings, for example. Mm, yeah, that this is the kind of idea that the destruction of the kingdom of Israel and then of the kingdom of uh, Judah, the kind of two Israelite kingdoms. Uh, yes, that the that the reason that this happened was because of the sinful behavior of the Israelites in general and the kings in particular. Yeah, and it was very common, I think, throughout the Middle Ages for Christians to kind of use those uh, those texts and kind of apply them to themselves whenever something right, bad absolutely. was happening. And, you know, and there are a number of crises to which people then responded with uh, various kinds of religious processions to really kind of, you know, emphasize that, okay, God, we fucked up, we're sorry. Yeah, yeah, like the Please Black Death being... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, let's institute these new laws to, you know, get rid of all the prostitutes, because clearly that's why God's sending the Black Plague. Mm, yeah. But yeah, so that's definitely an ideology that felt, you know, that is true to this exact time, more yeah. broadly, that is realistic for the Middle Ages. Yeah. There's this, there's one other kind of little thing that they got, that they got very solidly right that I did just want to mention quickly, mm. is that they have a lot of emphasis on Lindisfarne on the fact that we see the monks uh, in the process of producing books, and we see that there's this elaborate book that Athelstan takes with him when he is brought as a slave. And Lindisfarne in the late 8th century was, of course, a quite important and famous center of book production, with the 8th century Lindisfarne Gospels really being one of the most fabulous books that we have from the early Middle Ages. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, a center of, of learning in general. In my final yes. year at university, I was lucky enough to do a whole module on the age of beads so it's a little bit before mm. the vikings show, show yeah. up but it was kind of like it was incredible that you had this you know hugely significant intellectual figure living kind of on the at the edge of the world as it would have been perceived at the time right i i wish we had a uh, bead talking about the vikings yeah yeah uh... <laughs> if only yeah he yeah i just just uh double checking the exact dates that yeah he died about uh yeah. 50 60 years before, before the uh the first viking attack yes yeah it would have been it would have been nice to have him on the vikings yeah yeah it would have been sad if he'd been one of the monks that they just indiscriminately slaughtered though <laughs> that too so in terms of now things that are not quite right or maybe that there's kind of a little bit of each I wanted to bring up specifically the different kind of opinions and uh, histories about shield maidens. So Ligurta mm. is referred to as being a shield maiden. There's a couple other uh, visuals that we have of women who are warriors as well. So this is an idea that is not coming from nowhere. It comes very much out of North, Norse legends and mythologies. And Ragnar Lothbrok, who I'll talk about more in a second is in particular described as having shield maidens accompany him on his raids. However, there's a lot of debate about whether shield maidens really existed in Viking society or whether they're just something that are appearing in legends and in mythology. It is generally accepted that for the most part, Viking society is fairly patriarchal on the whole. There is certainly some respect for women as being skills and as performing certain kinds of labor that are essential to the households. And it is also the case that when the Vikings ultimately traveled to new places and settled there, that women are always coming with them because they have a very strong awareness of them of needing full families, essentially, for husbands and wives to come and together work to create these settlements. Yeah. And so I would say it's a kind of patriarchal society as a whole, but certainly one that has a respect for the role that women play, even if it is essentially a kind of variant on what you might consider stereotypical gender roles. But then there are these legends about shield maidens, and there also have been a few bodies that are biologically identified as female that have been found buried with weapons, which are traditionally male grave goods. Mm. So in particular, there's a Viking grave in Burka in Sweden, which based on the grave on grave goods, everyone has always assumed this is a high status male warrior. And in 2017, so actually a few years after this show first aired, 
they discovered based on DNA evidence that the body of this person, whether this person was in fact biologically female. There's been a lot of attempts to interpret this and based on this there are a number of scholars who have come to increasingly suggest that there is some possibility that shield maidens were in fact a real thing. But one of the more intriguing interpretations, and one that in some ways actually makes a lot of sense to me, in terms of how this coexisted with there being in other ways quite defined traditional roles for women, is that the Vikings had a somewhat more fluid understanding of gender than we might otherwise assume, and that in particular the Vikings conceived of there being a gender that's neither male nor female entirely. Mm -hmm and some people as belonging to that, so that there are these people who would have been assigned female at birth that then became warriors, but that they would not have been understood purely as women in Viking society. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 quite possible. I guess it's, it's, this is one of the really frustrating things about not having more written material from the Vikings right. themselves, from the time period, the fact that it's all from Iceland after Christianity has been adopted and it's kind of like it's looking backwards at 100, 200, 300 year remove. Right, exactly. So that's definitely, as you said, one of the frustrating things that we don't have these texts. But I think it's a really interesting interpretation and honestly one that makes some amount of sense to me, especially because uh, medieval thinking had a lot more of understanding of gender as being something fluid than honestly in some ways than people, let's say maybe not today, but people say 50, 60 years ago. Mm that there's much more of a that there's a there's a kind of quite frequent use of explicitly kind of gender bending and uh, male figures being described in feminine ways and vice versa there's you know the story of a female saint who grows a beard within uh, Norse mythology there is a is it Loki that I can't remember now I can't remember but there is a god who then gives birth a male god who gives birth that sounds like something that would happen with Loki um, I think that's Loki and I think yeah. that's the birth of the horse Sleipnir. Yeah, that sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, I, I think that's right, at least. But there, but there is certainly at least this kind of account of a male god who then gives birth. So it's really fascinating that just in terms of the way that people in general thought about gender in the medieval world, it's really actually not quite as rigid as, as I said, how people thought about gender, say, 50, 60 years ago. Hmm. And of course, that then this is coming out of uh, biological understandings of or understandings of biological gender that are held by a lot of people in the Middle Ages, that women are believed to be essentially inside out men in the sense of how genitalia is expected to work with the then possibility that if you like ran around too much that your penis would fall out, <coughs> which again, raises this interesting possibility of there being, you know, of them having these understandings that people who are assigned female at birth or assumed to be female can then become men. Mm. And so I think like the way that people think about gender in the Middle Ages in general is much more fluid than you might think. And that it seems very feasible to me that the Vikings might be an example of this and that that would be a reasonable explanation for how women who are essentially expected to do certain kinds of specific household based labor could coexist with a possibility for women to become shield maidens or to become warriors, but not necessarily being considered to be quite in the same category as other women. Well, and certainly they would be probably doing some pretty hard agricultural labor so right. they certainly weren't like the 1950s housewife you know oh yeah absolutely kind of that... like everything is done by your appliances so you're not really developing your muscles and there's a there's a cultural norm against feminine uh, musculature so right. yeah i doubt they would have had those taboos in the same way so i do think that is important to think about is that even in the case of women who are not warriors that the rules that are envisioned for them, while quite specifically defined and in some ways traditional, do involve uh, perhaps things that would not be considered part of traditional gender roles now, including various forms of hard labor. Mm. The thing that I would say I most was kind of irritated about in terms of things that they got wrong are some odd choices, I guess I would say, overall made about dates. Mm. They choose to open it in 793 AD with this raid on Lindisfarne. Well, that's because they really want Ragnar to be there. Exactly. But that's something of an issue because the things that Ragnar Lothbrok, who is, uh, I guess I would describe as a real legendary 
figure. There is not any evidence that he really existed, but he is referred to in both Old Norse sagas and in some Frankish accounts as being a Viking leader. So he's referred to in a number of these different sources, but is not necessarily considered to be a real figure, but the people who are identified as his sons are probably, are believed to be real historical figures. But the period at which pretty much all of these sources agree that Ragnar would have been active is really in the mid 9th century. Yes. So basically they kind of allied the dates a little bit in order to Put Ra in order to basically to have Ragnar Lothbrok be the main character and to be the central kind of participant and leader in this very first Viking attack on England, but then also have him continue to be important in these kind of subsequent attacks that I assume some of them might come up in the f future seasons. Yes. Yeah, it was kind of like, it was too big a deal in the historical sources to not have him there, I guess. Exactly. So there's, there's a little bit of elision of dates in that, you know, if Ragnar was like, you know, this like good looking 30 year old man at the, um, at the attack on Lindisfarne in 793, then he's going to be like 80 by the time he actually does all the things that in Legends Ragnar Lothbrok is referred to as having done. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Lothbrok, by the way, means hairy breeches, which is, I think, much, much less sexy for than what they're going for with him. Yeah, I remember um, I really wanted to, to bring her up, actually. Um, uh, Elizabeth Ashman Rowe, who I think like wrote a book about Ragnar Lothbrok that's really hard to mm -hmm. find. But she did a, a guest appearance on the History of Vikings podcast and also the In Our Time episode that I mentioned. Uh, her translation of, of his name was Shaggy Pants, which I thought was, was very funny. <laughs> That's pretty great. Ligurta is also a figure who is uh, quite common in a number of uh, accounts that are considered to be really more legend than fact, but does in these accounts appear as both a shield man and a warrior and as Ragnar's and as Ragnar's wife. First, yeah, first wife before... First wife, yes. Yeah, someone else yes. comes along. Uh-huh. Uh, and the story that Ragnar tells his son in the first episode that, oh, I had to defeat a bear and a hound in order to win your mother's hand in marriage, uh, that then does... That comes from the uh, Gesta Denorum. Mm, yes, the Saxo Grammaticus source. Yeah. yeah. They made what is probably ultimately a reasonable decision that in most of the accounts, her son with Ragnar is named Fridleif and is uh, changed then to Bjorn, which is yeah. potentially a good decision in terms of, you know, do you really want to have uh, multiple seasons of following a young boy named Fridleif? Yeah, yeah, it's less less chortle inducing. This then issue in terms of the dates then comes up as well with uh, uh, King Ela of Northumbria, who was presented as being Ragnar's kind of central enemy in England during this first season. He is a you know real historical figure, but one who is again dated to the mid ninth century and died in eight sixty seven. Oh, seeing as you seeing as you're mentioning his death. Yes. We don't get to it in this season, but yeah, in the sources he may or may not get in the sources he gets blood eagled, which may or may not be a real thing. Yes, and if and so that is something that is then done to him by Ragnar's sons, according to the accounts, and the rationale for that is that he in fact is reportedly killed Ragnar by putting him by throwing him into a pit of snakes, which he does in fact do in the show with just a kind of random underling. Yes, yeah, it's like his commander who doesn't do a very good job. In England, which, you know, we have one kind of poisonous snake here, which is an adder. <laughs> so, and that definitely seems to be a more exotic snake pit. So that's one of those aspects of the sources, which I'm like, mm, there's some pretty heavy artistic license going on here. Right, like, where did you get all of those snakes, friend? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and wasn't that difficult to transport without people getting bitten by them? Right. No matter. Well, I mean, you know, the, the Vikings <laughs> had a quite, were involved in a quite wide-ranging trade. Maybe they themselves brought all the snakes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> According to these stories, he, yeah, with this snake pit, kills Ragnar, and then Ragnar's sons come and blood eagle him, which is... More or less uh, carving an eagle onto his back and then ripping out his entrails through it? Uh, lungs, I think. But yeah, yeah, oh yeah, just just his lungs? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I guess once, you're, once you're, you're reaching in, you might as well grab whatever you, you can. Whatever you can find. 
Yeah. In terms of dating as well, it looks like the the kind of Viking the kind of Viking longships as depicted in terms of like increasingly like looking pretty impressive. That those seem like they're kind of becoming much more common in the ninth century, although mm-hmm. they did manage to get as far as Lindisfarne in seven ninety three. So you know, I'll yeah. allow that in terms of the boats. They kind of make this choice overall to, I would say, kind of allied some of the differences in terms of dating in terms of okay we want Ragnar to be our main character we want him to be present at this event that is uh, quite a bit too early for him to have been involved in and then also again kind of making various choices throughout to have things that okay are attested in various accounts but they're attested in accounts from the 10th or 11th from the 10th or 11th century and we don't really have any reason to definitively know even assuming they're real, to definitively know that they actually date back as far as the early as the late 8th century. Yeah. On the whole, I will definitely say I appreciate that this is a series in which somebody actually did research and in which the choices that they made that are perhaps less than historically accurate, you can see where they're coming from and they kind of make sense. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely on this on the side of like reasonable-ish artistic license. <laughs> So with that, I wanted to move on to our next segment, Historia et Veritas, where we talk about a real historical event or phenomenon. And here I wanted to highlight an aspect of the Viking past, which is one that just, I guess I would say, doesn't come up in this show, at least thus far, at least not in the first season. Hmm. And this is something that I'm bringing up in particular because... uh, While I don't want to, you know, I'm not obviously saying that this is a white supremacist show, it to some extent confirms an idea about the Vikings, which has really been latched onto by, in the United States at least, by white supremacists. Well, and and by the OG Nazis. Oh, yes, yes, exactly. That this is, that this is, yeah, exactly. This is not new, the kind of like real, like, wow, the Vikings are great. The Vikings are this great exemplar of the white race. And uh, that this is the kind of model that, uh, you know, we should be following these kind of great white Scandinavians. And yeah, they're and a sign of the super- of our superiority. And this whole kind of like will to power, we want something and therefore we will take it by force. And that in, in, in itself justifies the action. And therefore rape is fine and theft is fine and killing people you don't like is fine. It's basically if you can make it happen, then it's cool because we're Nazis. and Yeah, and genocide is great yeah this is an idea about the vikings and a you know way in which the vikings are often seen which is uh, really one that white supremacists have latched onto in you know and... recent in the recent and not quite so recent past and so especially given that history you know that history of uh, ideas about the vikings and uh, it's honestly quite dramatic significance in the United States right now, it is worth emphasizing that this idea of the Vikings as being this essentially isolated Scandinavian society of people who based on our current racial categories would be identified as white is not entirely an accurate representation of what Viking culture actually looked like. First of all, the TV show makes the interesting choice to present the East as basically impoverished and why would we ever want to go raid east and clearly we have to go off to the west. England is really not where it's at in the Middle Ages or in the early Middle Ages in particular in the late 8th, early 9th century. Yeah. Nor for that matter is Francia. The place to be is the Islamic world, is by far the wealthiest and most cultured part of the medieval world. Yeah, and to a lesser extent, the Byzantines. Yes, exactly. And so uh, East is really, honestly, in some ways, going further East than they, I think, have been going at this point would, in fact, ultimately be, in a lot of ways, a much better bet. Yeah, you have to go kind of East and down. But that is something that the Vikings ultimately did, that by the 11th century, the Vikings participate, uh, they're raiding, but they're also participants in a trade network, which extends from... uh, in the West, from England, from France, as well as from as well as Muslim ruled Spain, but then also to India and the Persian Gulf in the East. Increasingly, Vikings are very much aware of the Islamic world and very much in contact with and engaged in trade with Muslims. So this is something that's been supported by archaeological evidence. Uh, so certainly in terms of trade, there have been huge numbers of uh, silver coins with Arabic inscriptions that have been identified as ones minted in Baghdad, which have been found in 
basically Viking uh, Viking hordes in Scandinavia. Yeah, and in large, large, large numbers. So it isn't like yeah, so yeah, isn't massive like these, quantities. Is, isn't like oh, these three that randomly turned up because you had one particularly enterprising Viking dude who made it down there, but he was the exception. Yeah, right. There's in such huge quantities that really the only explanation is a quite frequent travel to and trade with the Islamic world. Yes. So this definitely highlights the fact that the Vikings are very much aware of and in close contact with people of various cultures and ethnic backgrounds, and that also these are not always relationships or connections that are marked exclusively by war and killing, that the Vikings seem to have been essentially quite pragmatic about the fact that Basically, there's a time for raiding and a time for trading. Also worth keeping in mind that the Vikings, thus far, at least in the TV show, that there's just an emphasis on the kind of they go somewhere and they're very there very quickly and they come back. And that's absolutely something that happened. But the Vikings are also quite interested in expansion and in creating new settlements, which, of course, they would eventually do in England, yeah. as well as, of course, a number of other places. In the places where the Vikings settle, it's worth noting that based on, again, archaeological evidence and analysis of the kind of material culture of these Viking settlements, that there's a lot of reason to think that far from insisting on the superiority of their own particular culture, they're quite willing to assimilate in a number of ways, with their settlements often becoming nearly indistinguishable from other people who are living in that geographical area. That flexibility and willing to adapt also is something that, again, is coming up in terms of religion. So something that we've talked about already is that it seems like there were probably relatively early some Vikings that were like, yeah, we're fine with Jesus, if not necessarily immediately Vikings that were interested in becoming, you know, entirely Christian. But that by about the kind of 10th, 11th century, the Vikings would have been, in fact, a probably religiously mixed group that would have included certainly both some Christians and some pagan Vikings. Yeah. And recent evidence also has raised the possibility that there might have been Muslim Vikings. So in 2017, some researchers realized that these Viking funeral garments that for years they'd just been like, oh, these have a weird pattern on them. That this pattern is, in fact, Arabic inscriptions from the 10th century that includes the words Ali and Allah. And these are textiles that then strongly resemble ones found in Muslim ruled Al-Andalus. This was a discovery just made in 2017. Scholars are still talking about how to go about interpreting them, but they very much raise the possibility that some Vikings might have converted to Islam or at least adopted certain Muslim ideas and practices as part of this kind of religious syncretism. So I think this is a really fascinating thing to learn about the Vikings in that we do see the Vikings as being this kind of both violent and, and isolated people in many ways, that they are not isolated and that they are very much part of a medieval world, which is multi-religious, which is intercultural, uh, inter-ethnic. And this is very much a kind of change in how we're thinking about the Middle Ages in general. And uh, one that is, you know, I think increasingly is, first of all, both better history, but also important in terms of what's happening in the United States right now and mm. how a number of people are misusing medieval history in general and the history of the Vikings in particular. Yeah, and it's a, it's, it's a world where rigid, the border is specifically here is probably not nearly as prevalent as as it is in much more recent you know societies it was kind of like spheres of of influence and big wide buffer zones yeah the white supremacists are claiming certain things about the middle ages as being uh, their personal ideal and then in turn also people on the not terrible side insisting on describing certain things as quote medieval when that's also inaccurate and again you know a lot of our most terrible things of that are happening in society that people are like, oh, this is medieval or this is medieval ideology. No, actually, it's just very much modern. This is, yeah, this is on yeah. us. We can move forward to our next segment, Fabula Nostra, where we come up with an alternative version of uh, the story or something inspired by this piece of media. Oh, by, by the way, I'm really sad that I haven't uh, been able to slot into Ollie's former role of singing the uh, the intros to the sections. <laughs> I really should have insisted that on that on a, as a condition of uh, <laughs> of doing the show. If you'd offered, I would have been thrilled. Yeah, oh, I was. I think I was just being too like stereotypically like polite, and uh, <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. I should have. I should have been more assertive. Can I do it for this one? Of course, go for it. 
Fabula Nostra. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was terrible. Um, but anyway, you were saying... Related to the kind of themes that I was talking about in terms of uh, the kind of intercultural elements of Viking history, I would love to really emphasize this in my version of the Viking TV show. And I also think it would be cool to emphasize this idea of the kind of Viking shield maidens as being gender fluid. So I'd like to have a story that's set, in fact, in the Viking East, so maybe in the Viking settlement in Rus. So this is a place where Vikings certainly would have come into contact with and been trading with Muslims as well. So as much as I do overall want a more diverse cast, I am going to have a nice Scandinavian-looking Viking lord, and I'm going to have him be played by Chris Hemsworth. Fair enough. <laughs> so he can he can go from playing Thor to playing a just run of the mill Viking. Who might just be called Thor because it was a name that they liked. Exactly, using. yeah. And it'll be like a little like tongue in cheek, and everyone will be like, ah, he's playing Thor again. But I also think that it would be hysterical and really annoy some white supremacists if he, uh, if not necessarily converts to Islam, kind of ends up like adopting certain Muslim practices. And I would really enjoy this as something that would then make a lot of people angry about this show. And then I'd like to have a kind of Muslim. Uh, like traitor, let's say, who he's kind of in contact with and has some kind of interpersonal relationship with, who I'm going to have played by Rami Malek. That would be cool, yeah. And I also wanted to note that I, again, I do, I love this interpretation of uh, this idea of the shield, of the, you know, people called the shield maidens as they're in fact being these kind of perhaps gender fluid Viking warriors and would love to include a character who is one of those people and would love, in fact, to cast somebody who is uh, gender fluid or non-binary. And so I just wanted to make a note that I would like to do that. Unfortunately, I spent some time looking up this material. There are a lot of uh, actors who seem to be great and getting a lot of buzz who you know would fit into this specification or request in terms of casting. They're not people that I've actually seen in things, unfortunately, so I'm not going to make a distinct casting recommendation because as I said, I just don't know what their individual styles are like. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. that I would say that would be the ideal casting. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, and that, that definitely would be an interesting way to, yeah, to go about telling the story. That would, that would I think, be my, my big thing that I would want to see in a new series about the Vikings would be something that's really taking advantage of and playing with and telling interesting stories on the basis of this really exciting new scholarship that I think honestly makes the Vikings much more fascinating than I've previously found them to be. So what would you what do you have in mind? So my idea is uh, it's it needs some uh, development, but um, I've read various I haven't read the whole thing, uh, but I've read various summaries of the Laxdala saga, which is set in set in Iceland primarily, but there's some stuff with going back and forth in Norway and it follows several generations so it might be a case of for the series like centering in on the heart of the story almost which is focuses around this love triangle between uh, a woman called Guthrun who is described as the uh, most intelligent and most articulate uh, woman who's ever lived in Iceland uh, and mm -hmm. also one of the most beautiful and two foster brothers Kjartan, who is like the grandson or the great grandson of an Irish princess who was like sold as a sold as a slave and assumed to be deaf mute, but actually turned out to be Irish, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and then teaches her teaches her son Irish and Bolly, uh, who is who is the the other foster brother, and they essentially end up. She falls in love with Kjartan initially, and Kjartan wants to marry her but then goes over to Norway for several years and won't let her come uh, with him then Bolly comes back who has also gone with Kjartan and basically says yeah Kjartan's not coming back so you might as well marry me so mm -hmm. reluctantly she ends up marrying him then Kjartan does come back right. and a fight ensues and uh, and Kjartan ends up being killed so it's very like soap opera yeah but it has some kind of good like one-liners in it when kyartan gets gets killed guthrun says uh says to bolly morning tasks are very i've spun 12 things of cloth and you've killed kyartan <laughs> so yeah that that sounds like it could be a really interesting and kind of like i say quite so proper e yeah um, definitely i've heard like the family icelandic sagas as being described kind of like westerns in some ways 
mm-hmm. which is a cool idea. Um, so for my casting for those three key players, I wanted Michael Fassbender as as Kiartan, kind of as mm. I will acknowledge the kind of Irishness mixed in there. Yeah. And if I were going back far enough in the series to establish you know his ancestry i'd i'd probably want saoirse ronan as being Mm. his i think it's grandmother or great-grandmother and then as guthrun uh, i think rosamund pike would be great i mean she's been great in everything i've seen her in and then uh probably tom hardy as as bolly as the other uh foster brother um i feel i feel like slightly this is struggling from everyone i've cast being slightly on the older side of people who Mm -hmm. are just getting married as they're all like 40 or pushing 40 so yeah (laughs) maybe if i was making this 10 years ago it would be ideal but uh yeah i I, i'm sure we could make it work yeah definitely everyone's always plays younger than they actually are right yeah yeah that sounds fun so would you uh would you also like to sing us into our ratings section estimatio what would your reading be i'm gonna make you i'm gonna put you on the spot by making you sing and i'm gonna then have you uh be the first to give your rating i think i would give this a a solid a solid four Mm -hmm. i think the character development is is good I, i mean i like that there's they're kind of like a little bit of nuance we mentioned with the with the Earl Harold, so mm-hmm. you get some of his backstory. So he's not just a cardboard cutout villain, and I think I think that's partly yeah. partly Gabriel Byrne's uh, performance is is very good. I mean, generally all round, it, the performances are are very strong. I yeah. think definitely understand the concerns you raised as far as the the rape side of things that was something i yeah did make me queasy but it didn't seem to be quite as gratuitous as it sounds like it's got in in game of thrones and i really liked that they had done their homework and yes they took a artistic license to things but they didn't just make things up out of whole cloth for the most part so i thought that was that was cool yeah i would say there are definitely things that i appreciated about this especially in terms of uh, how they are clearly doing research and then uh, kind of trying to make things work and taking liberties that i think overall are understandable i'm gonna knock it down to for my rating i've decided that i'm going to knock it down to a three and for me that really is the issue in particular with if i'm watching nine episodes of television i don't need to see like six rapes or attempted or attempted rapes that's totally fair it feels it feels excessive and it feels gratuitous to me uh not that it's the only you know piece of media that has that particular problem but it is something that uh genuinely does i would say bother me both in terms of you know that being a choice about how women are depicted in that being such a central part of women's stories and then also in particular with this being this kind of catch-all look the middle ages everything was violent and it was bad and look there was just rape all the time yeah yeah i wonder almost whether the fact that it's like that it seems it seems to be that the that the, the show owes its existence to the success of game of thrones i would say it yes. definitely seems to be following in the wake of that and so i don't know whether there's a like well, Game of Thrones does that, so we're gonna we're gonna do it too. Yeah, and you know, and I'll be honest, I do to some extent, despite that, probably because I, you know, started watching it a long time, watching it and reading the books a long time ago. I do have something of a soft spot for Game of Thrones, with the exception of the final season, uh, mm. but we won't get into that. <laughs> I'll get to that when I come to it in terms of my discussion of that particular series. But this, you know, watching it right now at the exact moment that I was in, it was something that I felt like really interfered to some extent with my kind of overall experience of the series. And so because of that, uh, I think a series that based on it doing some really good things in terms of research and in terms of character development might have gotten a four and is getting knocked down to a three for me. Yeah. Where can people find you on the internet? So I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Alistair underscore Pitts. So and and I also I have a podcast on mostly russian films but sometimes we do films that are telling like russian stories or russia connected stories that are made by hollywood or you know sometimes mm-hmm. occasionally uh in britain and so that is called Rus files unite movie podcast so there's also a twitter account for that so that's just at Rus files U. great podcast i definitely highly recommend you all check it out And if you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe in your preferred podcatcher app and rate and review us five-star ratings on Apple Podcasts. And I will read new five-star reviews in future episodes.
Please also follow us on Twitter at Media Evil Pod. That's M E D I A E V A L P O D. And join our Facebook group. If you have any questions for us, I would love to hear from you via email at media.evilpod at gmail.com. And you can also find me at, on Twitter and Instagram at Sarah F. Decker. Thank you for listening to Media Evil. Ali, thank you for joining me. Thanks very much for having me on. All right. Thanks. Bye. See you in two weeks. Bye. Thank you.